as usual, I've posted the lesson plans for week 13 and created a separate page. I also made one small change. I replaced the movie from week 13 with the movie from week 14 because Speedway is yet another silent film, a comedy, and it doesn't add much to what we've seen so far. Keep in mind the other changes that were discussed previously. That is to say, this is the week before Thanksgiving. Then next week, of course, we will only meet on Tuesday. They're going to be here on Tuesday, right? Because you have the whole of Wednesday to travel to Alaska or Hawaii. And after that, and keep in mind that next week I will also be providing the shortlist for the final exam and answering any questions about the exam's format. But keep in mind that with the classes for week 15 have been replaced by the time that I'll be spending on Zoom with you listening to your presentation or uh, if you send, share with me a pre-recorded video with your presentation, uh, there will be another asymmetrical virtual kind of encounter, okay? So you only have to bear my face for three more classes and then the final exam. This is the page for week 13. I'm going to talk about the motor maids across the continent today and possibly either Thursday or next Tuesday. And as usual, I put together a separate page with some notes, ideas, and some passages. I also have a PDF where with a digital pen, I highlighted some passages. If there is time, I'll be using that as well to illustrate the text. For the movie, you find a separate page with a selection of pictures that I'll be using to illustrate the synopsis, the story of the film, and some links on where to find the film and reviews, etc. And the assignment, which is also the last assignment, is simply the last set of excerpts from Catherine Stokes, The Motor Maids Across the Continent. And even though it says chapters 9 through 24, it's fewer chapters because there is in between chapter 9 and chapter 21 or so, there is a uh, summary of the events that I put together myself. Keep in mind for these excerpts, what you find, the paragraphs, the entire paragraphs you find in italics are my own summaries of any narrative gap. Okay, and this is the page with notes and ideas about the motor maids across the continent. Let's put it in a context first. It's 1911 and the automobile by then is rapidly becoming a very successful technology. I said multiple times that 1907 is when the product and the industry make the definite change that will allow the automobile as a technology to become sufficiently reliable for regular use and the industry to produce thanks to uh, the innovations uh, introduced by among others harry ford the kind of assembly lines the structure of the factories etc will allow, these changes will allow the automobile factories to produce more cars cheaply. So by 1911, in the US alone, the cars that were being produced were a few hundreds of thousands. And even though there were still hundreds of separate companies in the United States alone in 1911, only a few dozens really 
we're able to produce more than a thousand cars. Among them, of course, the first company in terms of numbers was Ford. Interestingly, if you go back to 1910, 1909, 1910, 1911, you see that between 1909 and 1911, every year Ford doubled their production of cars up to, for 1911, roughly 80,000 cars. 10 years later, 1921, though surpass 1 million cars sold per year. And it happened in 1921. It could have happened before, but keep in mind that in the late 1910s, you have the war, World War I, and that depresses the internal economy. People have less money for a large ticket item such as the automobile, and a lot of the automotive production is redirected towards the needs of the military, okay? At the same time, if we're talking about the commercial context, we must also keep in mind that during this time, magazines and books of fiction for entertainment, for popular entertainment, are a big industry, are a big business. People during this period see a lot of shows in theaters. They start going to the cinema theaters in larger numbers, but they're still reading a lot of books. There are a lot of educated people. Books are cheaper. There are a lot of popular books uh, printed on cheap paper that don't cost a lot of money. So that is an industry also that is burgeoning, that is blossoming, that is developing. And clearly it must be, it is logical that the publishing industry would try and capitalize on the trend of this fashionable product that is the automobile. And the book we are reading from, The Motor Maids Across the Continent, is part of a series of books devoted to this group of characters called The Motor Maids, which are a group of teenagers from a West Haven, Connecticut high school, which go everywhere. They go through the United States, as in this case, they go to Europe, they go to Asia, they go to Japan, for example. But this is just one in a long, large group of juvenile fiction series devoted to teenage characters driving the automobile, having adventures, having exotic adventures, and testing their independence thanks to the new technology. Of course, this is a form of escape, right? Uh, we're not talking about a reality. Few adults can afford an automobile still, let alone teenagers, right? But imagine the average American teenager being surrounded by commercials, ads for the automobile, seeing automobiles in larger numbers in their own environment, whether it be an, an urban environment, but by this time even uh, a, a rural uh, environment, the American Midwest, etc. Imagine these teenagers dreaming of becoming an adult, being introduced to society thanks to this technology. So, who is Catherine Stokes? No one, at least we don't know. It is not a real name. During this time, it was popular for publishing houses to take over the authorial function, to take over the function of the author and create a package for a series of books to be sold, hiring authors, hiring writers to develop a narrative according to a set of criteria or a template that was decided by the editors, by the managers of the publishing house. 
So Catherine Stokes was the pseudonym that was chosen for this series. It was a series about a group of female characters, so they uh, created a female name. We don't even know whether the authors were one or many, probably it was a plurality of authors, and whether they were male or female. This is the name of the publishing company in Chicago, New York, that produced it. And these are other examples, some of them even more famous. For example, the Straight Meyer Syndicate, and you find a Wikipedia page devoted to this uh, professional practice of hiring ghostwriters to put together books in a series that was highly templated. The Straight Meyer Science Syndicate was responsible for the Motor Boys and the Motor Girls series. Notice the similarities, right? Motor maids, motor boys, motor girls. And you can see how many titles were produced if you click on these links. You can see how many, and most of these are uh, available for reading. In this case, the Motor Boys were under the name of Clarence Young, but even that was a pseudonym. And the Motor Girls as well. This was an editorial, a publishing approach or practice that continued <laughs> through the 1920s and 30s. You may have heard about the character of Nancy Drew because uh, it originated a film that was produced a few years ago. It was a fairly big budget film about this character that is the female protagonist of a series where Nancy Drew is an amateur detective. And the boys equivalent of Nancy Drew was the Hardy Boys series. Actually, the Hardy Boys came first in the 1920s 1927 or so, and Nancy Drew from the 1930s. But this series continues through the 1940s and 50s. Even I, as a kid, I was born in 1963, but in the early 1970s, during the summer, I was reading the Italian translations of the Hardy Boys, and I read a couple of Nancy Drew books. In fact, I still have uh, a few of, of those books. So imagine the long-lasting popularity is something produced in the 1920s and 30s being read even 40 years later, which attests to the uh, quality of the packaging, right, uh, that was done. For the Motor Maid series, you find almost all of the books that were published on internet, especially on Gutenberg and uh, others on Google Books, and if you're curious, you can open these links and have a look at these, and you see that you have three books in 1911, exactly because you have a plurality of author working on them, although they're not complicated books, neither to write or to read. They're young adult fictions, the pages, uh, normally these books are about 300 pages, but each page is less than 200 words. But you see three books in 1911 because the series was being successful. One in 1912 and then 1913 and 14. And you have an idea of the topics from the titles themselves. Sunrise Camp, Fair Japan, Rose Shamrock and Thistle, which is a reference to Ireland, uh, Palm and Pine, which must be a reference to Florida, and the school days, which introduces the character. And I've included some quotes from this first novel. The popularity of the series was revamped a few years ago in 2017 when an award-winning poet and writer, Ron Paget published 
his own version of the book where reading motormates across the continent, he adjusted the language, made really a small number of changes to the plot and republished the book because he found it curious, exotic from his own point of view. And, and you find information about that on his own personal domain, ronpaget.com. And also, you, if you click on this link, you can hear a podcast where he talks, he explains why he found that original book so attractive. And you find an excerpt, chapter one is also part of our own set of excerpts. So you can compare and see how few the changes were to the beginning of that book. Let's have a short, quick look at similar juvenile fiction series based on the automotive technologies. And I've limited the examples here to books about teenagers with automobiles, but the range of technologies expanded through the 1900s and then the 1910s, right? You find uh, a series of juvenile books about motorboats, about some, uh, uh, submergibles, uh, planes, of course, uh, and, and plenty of them. So, if you consider the Motor Boys, which dates back to 1906, you go see the first illustration, the one found at the beginning of the book. It's interesting to see that the characters in this book called the Motor Boys are initially teenagers who practice the sport of cyclism. Because this, the arc of the character follows the arc of the mobile technologies, the technologies for mobility, in that through the 1880s and 90s, the automobile, the bicycle rather, was the individual technology par excellence. And the technology that afforded whoever practiced the sport, independence, a sense of adventure by exploring autonomous, autonomously an area, but also the feeling of speed. Because the bicycle gives, long before the automobile, a great sense of speed. And keep in mind that by the 1880s, bicycles were developed to the standards of the technology. So from a technical point of view, you don't really find any radical enhancements in the bicycles from the, the 1880s to our era. Yes, of course, nowadays you find carbon fiber or titanium, you find more advanced gear systems, but as far as developing the bicycle, uh, the aerodynamic, the ability of the bicycle through the shape of the chassis to be balanced with minimal effort, and this is confirmed by the fact that a well-made bicycle can be pushed and will travel quite a distance without anyone on top, right? Without falling because of the balance and the aerodynamic. So you find them initially on bicycles. Then through the narrative, you will find them on motorcycles by the end of the book. They've graduated to the automobile. Even though, keep in mind that motorcycles and automobiles developed pretty much at the same time. There is no transition in the technology from bicycles to motorcycles to automobile. In fact, the motorcycle technology struggled a bit until the engines were developed in such a way that you could have a powerful enough small engine installed on a motorcycle. But the sport uh, of, of motorbikes was also very popular during the 1900s and 1910s. Uh, people uh, went to see the races, especially lured by the idea of these daredevils, the speed and the crashes that were almost inevitable during the races. This is the conclusion 
at the end, the last chapter, you find an important letter. So there was a race and you see that Mr. Baker's son is going to, which is who is one in the group of motor boys is going to receive uh, an automobile, okay? Of course, they are pretty careful boys and their experience with the motorcycles have been good training for automobiling with, for them where the key phrase is pretty careful boys because in this kind of literature, yes, there is a sense of adventure, of, of pushing the norms for uh, as far as the independence of younger characters are concerned, but there is still quite a lot of morality at play, right? The norms are important in many ways, not just about safety, but also about being good boys altogether. And uh, for the Automobile Girls, the most famous title is the Automobile Girls in the Berkshires, right, which is not too far from here, right, Massachusetts, north of Connecticut. Uh, if you drive from Bridgeport, you're almost on a straight line, you reach the Berkshires. And you can find this novel as well on Google Books, but fewer of the Automobile Girls um, series uh, are, are available online. Now, keep in mind that women during this period occupy a central position in the development of the technology. There are a lot of female pioneers of the technology, female testers of automobiles, women involved in all kinds of uh, exploits and performances with the automobile. So I just want to remind you of this situation because again, during the second half of the 20th century in the media, TV series, cinema, you find a lot of negative stereotyping of women as poor drivers, as um, individuals in society who cannot possibly gain an understanding of the mechanical aspects of the automobile, but this is not what you find in the culture of the first two decades of the 20th century. So keep in mind how, for example, Alice Ramsey drove across the US with three women, 1909, so reminiscent vaguely of what we're going to read in the Motor Maids Across the Continent, in the novel, we're reading from the teenagers from West Haven are driving from Chicago to San Francisco. In here, in real life, Alice drove from Manhattan to San Francisco. And of course, you can find plenty of pictures from the period. So this picture is kind of small, but this would be Alice with a typical long coat of automobilists. And again, keep in mind that driving across the United States means not only to be able to drive the car, but also to be able to fix the car, because there is no way you can drive thousands of miles without breakdowns occurring also in places where no one will offer technical help, a garage, a tow truck, etc. And later on, because Alice uh, lived uh, almost to the age of 100, I think she was 97 when she died in 1983. In 1961, she published a memoir about her, her greatest adventure in life called Veil, Duster, and Tire Iron. Veil, because of course, you, you have a lot of dust coming at you on these unpaved road, roads without asphalt, and, and therefore you have to cover your face, protect your face from, from the dirt, the pebbles, the dust coming at you, and you can find more on various um, websites. Right, maybe this one has a vector picture. Yeah, somehow, so, somewhat better, and the same picture as well. Of course, some of these things were pure 
PR or media stand. For example, that's the case of the so-called Paramount girl, Anita King. So the Paramount uh, film company pays Anita King to drive across the United States by herself in 1915, covered by the media, plenty of articles, photographs that are published, and then they produce the next year a film titled The Race, and people have heard about it, and they go see the film, um, and, and she did uh, other films as well, and, and there were other uh, actresses exploiting the technology of the automobile. There is a picture in one of those links of Anita King, there it is. This is Anita King next to Barney Oldfield, whom we've seen in two different movies, and this in fact was a car driven by Barney Oldfield, uh, at shows, uh, not at races, this car was made for record setting speeds and it would just show up and drive around a local track and people would pay a ticket to see Barney also drive by at 100 miles per hour. In this case, they put together these two celebrities, Anita and Barney, and they gave, them, uh, a pri gave one of them a prize. Speeding Sweethearts is about films and women in films about um, the automobile. And these are other examples of women that made cross-country road trips going from coast to coast in the United States. And in this case, because of the publicity that would be generated by doing something like that, it was the National American Women Suffrage Association, a feminist political movement that was lobbying for voting rights for women that sponsored this trip in order to promote their ideas, even in the modern maids across the continent. You find a reference to uh, the suffragettes. Suffragette was a name, a label given to members of this movement and in many ways was a synonym for feminist. So when someone in the motor maids sees Billy, the driver of the Comet, climb on a tree with pants uh, in, in a context uh, where women wearing pants are not traditional women, then the narrative suggests that they must have thought the, the men uh, uh, looking at this scene must have thought that she was a suffragette, which is another way to say she was a feminine, feminist. Other, among the record setters, uh, uh, record setting women, you also find uh, among those famous during this time, Violet Cordery, known as the long distance lady because her records had to do with covering very long distances, thousands of miles, during a short period of time, or even more uh, odd uh, records such as longest distance be being driven going, uh, um, going backwards. Let me see if I have a picture in here. Yep, there is Violet in in this article from Petrolicious, and uh, one of the records mentioned in the first line, driving in reverse for 25 miles, or other records from the 1920s, uh, she went to Italy, to Monza, Monza is one of the oldest racetracks in Europe and also had a ring originally for high speed. You can still find remnants of that ring. It's not used anymore and it's falling apart, but you'll see, for example, in a famous uh, film about Formula One from 1966. Um, so she went to Monza and she 
was part of a team of six who drove 10,000 miles without interruption, just alternating between those six, like an endurance race, right? This would be 10,000 miles would be like three times or two and a half times the 24 hours of Le Mans. Average speed, 56.47 miles per hour. They did it again for 5,000 miles longer, 15 miles, and the speed was around the same, etc. And these are some of the books devoted to what women did with cars during the early 1900s and the 1910s. So it's necessary to provide this context to have a full understanding of a novel such as The Motor Maids, which is a fantasy novel, but it plays on also, among other things, this strong public connection between women and the automobile. So the young female readers of this novel also had in mind some of those examples, right? So they knew it wasn't just fantasy, but there was some reality to it. So as far as the automobile, the technology in this novel, of course, the pro most prominent technology is the automobile, is the red car driven by Wilhelmina, nicknamed Billy uh, Campbell. And second, in terms of the frequency of references, is the plane, called with an obsolete word, aeroplane, which appears several times throughout the novel. And there are a few appearances by the motorcycle. This is a passage from one of the excerpts that are included in the required assignments. They, uh, the group has left Chicago. They haven't been traveling for much time. They're going through the plains of uh, Midwest, the Midwest, and then they see the plane, right? Flying westward, which is also their direction but still some distance away came what resembled at first a gigantic bird with wings outspread, soaring even as the fish hawk soars. As he skims through the air, it's an aeroplane, whispered Billy, almost speechless with excitement, right? Where you see the kind of fairy tale style used for, to describe these encounters with technology and the modeling of the acceptable reaction for these things. When you read, when the average reader from the period reads about Billy's reaction, this is the expectation of how they should react to seeing an airplane flying above them. As usual, as we've discussed in other instances, for example, Jules Verne, Whenever you want to place a technology at the center of a novel, you must have qualified members of society embrace, adopt the technology. It cannot be random individuals. And therefore, you go through the qualification of the characters, and, and these are uh, the, the characters and, and their social qualities. Their high school maids, they're female teenagers from West Haven High School, and even at that time when people read West Haven, Connecticut, they associated that area with wealth, right? So you know that these are members of the upper class or upper middle class. The real protagonist, the one character that stands out in this group is Billy, as I said before, her true name is Wilhelmina. And Billy is not only the driver, but also the one who's able to fix the car, or at least knows enough to try and fix the car on several occasions. She's also, she's still, even though 
she is fluent with this technology, she's still supposed to be a romantic heroine. So there are hints of romance, there are hints of romantic love. However, she remains independent, right? It's a series. You cannot have the character settle down, get engaged, get married. And this is not because of age, because during this age, uh, women got married early. We saw another example in a motor car divorce where Peggy gets married when she's 17 or around that age, but Billy cannot get settled because otherwise she wouldn't be able to travel. She wouldn't be able to perform her independence for the sake of the dreams of her readers. There is this suggestion that there is a natural predisposition in her to embrace the mechanical aspect of the technology. She's the daughter of an engineer, a railroad engineer. However, as in the case of Harry Potter or other characters for teenagers or preteens, she's an orphan practically. She has lost her mother and her father is away in Russia building a railroad uh, there, uh, working on a railroad track there. And she's been left in West Haven to go to school under the tutelage of her cousin, uh, which is referred to in here as uh, Miss um, Campbell, who's barely 10 or so years older than Billy and almost too old at risk of becoming a spinster. That's the role assigned to the cousin in, in here to be the chaperone because you cannot have uh, these teenagers drive around without an adult to m make sure that they follow uh, the rules. But it's also there to admonish them, to warn them that if they insist too much uh, on, on this path, this could compromise their chances of becoming socially acceptable models of womanhood, right? You don't want to remain in spinsters. There is morality in this kind of literature, not just adventure. And of course, as we said before, not having parents around grants uh, Billy a lot of independence, having her cousin there doesn't change much things because yes, uh, her cousin um, issues some moral judgments, but rarely, very rarely, the cousin will prevent the young teenagers from doing something. In fact, she's there mostly to sanction that everything is acceptable. It's like saying, as long as we have an adult, we can do whatever we want, and the adult not intervening makes whatever we do legitimate or look legitimate. The other kids, the other teenage characters don't really have a uh, marked profile and this helps anyone working on the series develop the series more quickly, right? Uh, they're Mary, Nancy, Eleanor. Mary has a slightly more prominent role as the one who follows in Billy's footsteps. The others are pretty much interchangeable. Of course, there are other female characters in, in this particular novel, especially Evelyn, who's a young woman from Utah, from Salt Lake City, who's escaping from uh, the, the harsh treatment of her father, uh, who's a Mormon, but is not reformed, meaning a hardcore Mormon. And Evelyn will be the protagonist of the happy ending of the novel because you need some kind of happy ending. So not only will the protagonists reach San Francisco from Chicago at the end of the novel, in spite of plenty of trouble they encounter on the road, uh, Billy will be kidnapped. Uh, they will be uh, by, by Native Americans, by two Native Americans. Later on, the whole group will be kidnapped by train robbers. 
because it's 1911, but they still managed to find a group of veteran Confederates, who must be pretty old by that time, who are robbing a train and take them on the ride. They managed to get to San Francisco, not to the city, rather to a vineyard outside of San Francisco, a vineyard run by Italian immigrants and there to celebrate the conclusion appropriately as you would find in plenty of films, you have the wedding between Evelyn, who's being reconciled with her father, so her father becomes a better man, and this is part of the morality play, right? You cannot go against the family, you cannot break up with one's father, although in this case it is the father who goes through a process of transformation and becomes a milder, more respectful man and, and supportive of this wedding. And who is Evelyn going to marry? He's marrying one of the flirts of Billy. A, a, a man, a cowboy, again, another vanishing figure, right? It's 1911, but you find a true uh, cowboy uh, running a big farm, not, not the cheap workforce laborer, uh, a, a richer representative of that category, but still an exotic uh, man model, uh, main model, uh, right? Uh, the cowboy for, for the readers, for the target readership of this novel. Evelyn and Daniel get married, but Daniel had is one of the men that Billy encounters throughout the novel, and there is a hint of romantic tension between them. I explain why Billy cannot get married, but Daniel deserves to be part of that happy ending, because when you dream, you cannot be dreaming just about automobiles. As a female reader, you must be dreaming about getting married as well, right? Because of the morality infused in this kind of literature. So this is the section about Cousin Helen. Right from the first page of the novel, Cousin Helen seems to uh, suggest some possible issues, right? She starts by saying, at my age, right? So she introduces the notion that she's kind of old to be traveling, to be traveling by herself, to be occupying her time with the automobile and traveling rather than thinking about settling down. And so this works as admonishment, as a warning for the younger characters. It's okay at your age, but not try not to be doing this in your late 20s because otherwise you're a lost woman, right? You're, you're lost to society. And what is the other concern of Cousin Billy, which is one of the themes in the novel, that by embracing the enhanced mobility afforded by the automobile, these young women, these teenagers, will turn into gypsies. Where gypsies are, of course, gypsy, you know, it's an exonym. Exonym means the name of a group, of an ethnic group, given by people on the outside that is not being used by the people inside this community. So the Roma people, don't call themselves gypsies, but this is the term that is used in the literature in the US and Europe during this time, seen as a negative example, right? It's somebody who doesn't have any roots and therefore does not conform to the standards of civilized society. So what happens if you travel in the automobile? Will you become an emigrant? Will you become a gypsy? So an emigrant, someone who's in transition from one place to another and has not uh, chosen one for a longer time, keep in mind that immigration to the US during this time was often temporary. That is to say, a lot of people came from Europe that would spend two, five, 10, 15 years in the US working, but then they would go back to Italy or France or other places hopefully with enough money to buy a house, a farm, a shop, a restaurant, etc. So, emigrant in here is someone who is local, but only temporarily, 
Gypsy is someone who is always on the move. And the idea is that if you embrace the, the technology of the automobile, then you embrace a new dimension, whereby mobility is not just a utilitarian performance taking you from point A to point B, but it's the new dimension of your life. Your life is on the move. Your place is on the road. And what are the social dangers of embracing this kind of lifestyle? The response to the concerns expressed by Helen Campbell, the older cousin, by one of the groups, one in the groups, probably Billy, but I don't remember exactly, is that yes, we might be turning into gypsies, vagabonds, or emigrants, but we're up to date. Meaning, this is a fashionable technology, we cannot be left out of this trend, because otherwise our identities will suffer. So you see here how consumerism marries with, merges into the narrative, right? Whereby having a product means to be able to afford a lifestyle. You don't buy the product for its function, you buy the product because your life changes, because the way you experience life changes, right? Which is part of the marketing of technologies from the automobile to nowadays the phone, right? For, uh, or, or specific apps for uh, the companies selling those products. So in terms of moral guardianship, Helen does the following when they encounter boys, that is to say young men on the road, Helen will give her judgment of them, right? So will indirectly instruct the younger women on how to treat these people. Are they honest? Are they wholesome uh, men, young men? Or are they dangerous and you need to stay away from them? This Helen will do. Again, what she doesn't do is stop the girls from doing something that is, is morally on the edge of what is acceptable. I've discussed this idea of uh, the dangers of turning into a spinster. You don't want that according to uh, the novel. And rather than restricting the actions of the characters, is there to say, I'm here, there is an adult, so we know that even though this situation is somewhat scandalous, the characters can only go so far. It's altogether something that is called a wild adventure. So there is the recognition that this is an, a socially and morally edgy kind of literature. The uh, characters are all urban women. And, and the perspective, the point of view of the novel is very urbanite because whenever they venture into the prairies, whenever they encounter animals, farms, lumberjacks, Native Americans, all of this is incredibly exotic to them. And somewhere in the presentation I've in included a link to the definition of exoticism in Wikipedia, but basically exoticism was one of the driving forces of literature, especially during the 19th century, although it originated uh, earlier, at least going back to the 1600s. And exoticism initially was the idea that whatever you encounter in strange places, in new foreign places, is really different from what you're familiar with, but then later anything that you're not familiar with, even in your own country, acquires this taste, this quality of being exotic. So for a group of characters that uh, have uh, acquired an urban culture, and possibly for the, most of the readers of these books, even cowboys, even American Native Americans uh, are exotic characters and, and their landscape and exotic territory. Look at the way they treat their exit from Chicago. So this is a passage from page eight. 
where the Red Comet with the women on board is driving early in the morning, leaving the city. And you can see that this is an allegory of them exiting civilized society, embarking in an exotic adventure by virtue of comparing them with the regular people and their habits through Chicago they world. Right, this the reference is always to speed and wind because of the air that comes to you in an open cockpit car. Past fine homes where sleeping maids and butlers were just opening windows and blinds to let in the morning light. So you know that they're not doing the same. They also have fine homes in West Haven, but they've abandoned them. They can afford, probably their families can afford staff servants in the house, but they are traveling without any of them. And they've left tranquility to become, they've left the warmth and safety of the homes to, be, to become vagabonds. Through business streets already humming with life, this is their rejection of work and, and the regular working life of regular people. And at last, out through the suburbs on a broad level road due west, they took their course. So they're living civilization and venturing in a place that sounds more exotic than America ever was or the West ever was in 1910 or 11. And right after that, page nine, they have to emphasize the difference. They have to emphasize the change by going back to their memories of the school because they are leaving in end of May or June and the journey will last into August when they will reach the proximity of San Francisco. Was it only last week, says one of them, that we were four school girls at West End and high school slaving over examinations, cried Eleanor Butler. Only a little week ago, exclaimed Mary joyfully, and now behold us, free as birds on the wing, which is vocabulary more or less that you find also in reference to the plane and not too far from the language used to describe speed on a car. The vocabulary is very limited, the syntax is very elementary. You can really see it's young adult fiction. In fact, there are similar books, for example, The Automobile Girls, the language there is more complex, the syntax a bit more complex, but this kind of novel can, could, could be read at a time by somebody who was 12 or 13 quite easily. Later on, when they find themselves in a place surrounded by Native Americans, cowboys, and all sorts of working class characters that look exotic from the perspective of an urban female, one of them, Mary says, it's like being in a play, right? It's like being in the middle of fiction. Eleanor whispered Mary, who was sitting next to her at the long dinner table in the dining room of the little hotel. They're all here, cowboys and curious looking people, right? So people are queer, people are different and there were two Indians at the door a moment ago. The cowboys are like Barney McGee. Barney McGee is a character from the um, book. At the same time, Barney McGee is also a character in a long poem uh, published twice um, in, in the first in the 1890s and then in 1909. So maybe they borrowed, the author borrowed the name from there. They have good rough manners. So this is not civilization. They're not civilized, but oh, what emotions that this produces in us. And of course, if you think about these remarks, pretty much when you go see the films during this period, you find a lot of the same characters. You find a lot of the same exotic qualities added to the story, right? People go to see the cowboys, the Indians, etc. The, the places that they're not familiar with. And there is this, this, this post-romantic trope. This is not something you find in here for the first time 
travel literature at the end of the 19th century is full of it, that traveling is much more exotic, much more particular, if you're visiting places and seeing people who are there, but who are about to disappear. So, translated into, let's say, travel literature to places such as Italy, you find British and American travelers who go to, for example, a small village in the mountains of Tuscany, and they talk about the place, they talk about the people, but they try to suggest indirectly, or they plainly state that although these people are very much like their ancestors, because they've lived in the same village for tens of generations, because they are not educated, because they don't have any contact with the civilized urban places, the big cities, the railroad, etc. All of this is about to change. The suggestion being that within a few years, within a generation, these people will be influenced by civilization and progress, will acquire an education, will sever their connections with the culture of their ancestors. They will stop repeating the same gestures, the same routines, the same practices, that had been attached to that place since the ancient Romans, or since the Etruscans, since the, population, the populations, the groups that existed before the Romans conquered Italy, right? There's this sense of impending doom, right? It, it's like those films that were popular during the 1940s and then and 30s, and, and then also later on the 1960s and 70s, where someone by uh, random discovery, uh, a lens on an island where you find uh, Stone Age men uh, or, or even Neanderthals and dinosaurs and animals. But this, by, by the end of the film, all of this disappears. There is a volcanic explosion or the army intervenes and kills King Kong or whoever, whatever specimen is left from that uh, uh, faraway era, okay? So you find there the last cowboys. So there's the qualification that these are the last authentic cowboys that they encounter, right? And one is Daniel Moore, the one who will marry Evelyn, the Mormon girl at the end. The other is Barney McGee. McGee. They encountered another cowboy who is in fact not authentic. However, he is an authentic British aristocrat trying to pass for a cowboy, Algernon Winston. Winston is the last name also in the Lightning Conductor, right? Every uh, British aristocrat in American literature must have a name like Winston. There are Native Americans, and they're not assimilated. In fact, they're dangerous. They're threatening, they're rebellious. And, and there are some racist issues in the description of these Native Americans, right? One of them, they say he's bad because he's half Indian, right? So it's neither here nor there. It doesn't belong exactly to any race, and this makes him turn into a criminal. There are train robbers who, uh, however, are, are dangerous. At the same time, one of them becomes a friend and will be redeemed. So instead of going to prison, he will become an, an outstanding member of society. And they hear by the end that he's working in a farm in the Northeast, because the Northeast is normalization. There are Mormons that are unreformed, meaning they haven't been integrated into the Federation, in the, uh, the, 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 the rules of the US, they're still practicing. Uh, the original polygamy and the other rules of the Mormons, and, and this makes, of course, makes them more exotic. And there are Southern Italians, Italian Americans in the vineyard at the end, who speak uh, with this accent uh, uh, with an eye at the end uh, of everything, and they're very nice, very welcoming. They prepare food. They, they make wine. They found in the US their natural environment because these are peasants, right? 
uh, it's like an entire race of southern Italian who are destined to be peasant and work best in that role. Uh, and, and this is where you find them, right? A vineyard is the perfect place for them to integrate their limited agricultural skills into American society and be nice to everyone and sing, uh, etc. So, and, and so this is the smorgasbord of the exotic elements in the novel. So how do you develop the narrative? One way is to present a challenge, right? And then to go through a demonstration that this challenge can be uh, performed, can be completed, right? For example, the core challenge of the book driving across the US continent from Chicago to San Francisco, half a continent. And there are challenges and records that are mentioned, being the first to do something or being up to date, so being on the cutting edge of some fashionable trend. And there is the mention of prizes for the planes who are doing this at the same time that they're doing this. There is a race that takes place around on, on July 4th where planes are going from San Francisco to uh, Chicago and, and there are prizes, actual monetary prizes, and there is fame to be gained. So you know uh, that uh, these things are important, acknowledged by society. There is the idea also of creating situations and scenarios where new and old practices, institutions, come to clash, right? Through the novel, they feel nostalgic from the end of the first day of their travel out of Chicago, but to combat or to balance this sense of nostalgia, missing the family, there is a sense of excitement of going to the frontier, right? To this exotic place. There is a contrast between past and future, right? The frontier is where the past is still present, but it's about to die. It's about to replace by another future. The future is automobile technologies, industries, etc. And this idea is pretty much a trope of classical literature and European literature for thousands of years is known as the Arcadia trope. The idea that when you go to the countryside, when you go to remote areas that are not touched by industrialization in this case, you find a more serene, more peaceful place and people are living by different rules and they're happier, right? And, and some of the media still reflect this, this trope, right? This idea that, yes, but if you go to Idaho or if you go to South Dakota, people love each other, they're respectful, everything is peaceful, is orderly, etc. But it, it's part of a cultural trope, this idea that there is a tension in society between moving on, moving towards the future, and staying attached to the past, and the past is connected to all sorts of positive values for that. But this is not to go back in time, it's just to emphasize that the future is so powerful that it can replace those positive values. Of course, there are quite, quite a few references to a racial configuration of society in the novel. They're minor, but you find them there. For example, Daniel Moore has Japanese servants uh, uh, in his farm in the American Midwest. As I said, there is a peculiar treatment of Native Americans and also of Italian Americans. And there is a contrast or a competition between different technologies such as the automobile and the car. From the narrative point of view, how does the novel proceed? In very simple fashion, with very simple strategies, for example, presenting a dilemma. What is going to happen now? Will this happen or that happen? Uh, what will happen now that we've been kidnapped? How will we get out of there? So instead of showing what the characters say or do, the narrative stops to offer the readers 
a variety of possible scenarios or outcomes to create some tension. There are a lot of simple descriptions of the places they travel through and simple transition. Now we do this, we go to dinner, we go to, to, to sleep and then we wake up the next day and we travel more. The adventure are exterior, meaning they're mechanical. It's not like the adventures take place inside the character. There is no spiritual, psychological development of the characters. It's all being bombarded by the stimuli of the journey that are exterior stimuli. So there are obstacles, there are enemies or rivals, all sorts of antagonists. There are thieves, multiple. There are bandits, robbers, right? Uh, there is a high school teacher who is connected to a relative who might want to uh, uh, execute a vendetta on, on these uh, students because they've made fun of the teacher. Of course, a lot of what happens is afforded by the fact that these characters are wealthy, right? So keep that in mind and uh, keep in mind the connection that we uh, emphasize that I mentioned before, marketing, giving you the idea that the product, the automobile is important because it gives you the chance to live differently, not because it helps you get to your destination sooner. No, no, your destination changes and how you get to the destination and how you feel about getting to the destination changes. This is what, what is important. And the novel is suggestive that teenage readers can explore through the narrative some new behaviors, new practices, and go through changes. Let's come to the themes. So I'll continue for about five minutes and then stop and I'll circulate the appointments. Thank you. So clearly, one of the main themes is the relationship with the technology, especially strong for Billy and the car. She's very attached to the car, she can fix the car, she drives the car, etc. There is this relationship that will never translate into a real romance between Billy and Peter. Peter is the aeroplanist who's driving the plane they see in the distance when they leave Chicago, the plane will crash the ground because Peter was sneezing. And the sneezes caused the plane to, to crash because of course he, he moved the, uh, the lever and, and went down. They uh, go and rescue Peter from the wreck. Peter is wounded, but not seriously. And they help him along the way. And then they will encounter him in strange ways. Peter is cutting edge in terms of technology because he's able to fly a plane. He's also a romantic hero of the old fashion, very polite, very respectful of, of women, uh, always with flattering words, but he might be a thief. So there are two suggestions about his potential thievery, one that is not really Peter van Vachten that he claims to be, but a thief who uh, performed a robbery in Chicago, then went to the airport, stole a plane, and is escaping on this plane, going west to uh, escape being captured. Of course, later, this, this rumor is dispelled, he's not that thief. But the second accusation or implication of thievery is that right after Peter is picked up by his servant and continues on his trip to San Francisco by himself, leaving uh, Billy and the other friends, Billy cannot find her purse with $50, and $50 was a large amount of money. By the end of the novel, we'll know that uh, the purse was left in the fields where the plane crashed, when Billy ran to save Peter to extract him from the wreck of, uh, of the plane, she dropped the uh, purse with the money and the wallet was found by a farmer and is sent to San Francisco. Uh, 
Peter is encountered by them along the journey. Uh, at some point, again, they suspect that he has stolen their car. In fact, he has borrowed their car and coming back. So the only, way, the only reason I'm emphasizing this repeated trope of the theory of Peter is that even romance has to become more cutting edge by suggesting that this man is dangerous, right? And, and you find a large chunk of romance novels even today is based on this, the so-called uh, dark romance or uh, dark mafia romance based on this idea that the male character idolized by the female protagonist and by the readers, by the film readers, is a perfect gentleman, but also a monster or a criminal, and, and this makes him more interesting. And the following passages, passage from pages 28, 29, is a perfect description of the romantic representation of Peter in connection to the use of the automobile. For a while, things seem rather dull to Miss Campbell and the motor maids. This is when they're traveling. So Peter has been picked up. The plane is crashed. He has survived. He's been rescued. And they're taking him west. He says, if you're going west, I'm going west myself. I'll come with you. So they're all in the car. Such a romantic halo encircles the head of him who flies through the air. So you fly a plane. You're using a cutting-edge technology that makes you more seductive. And this ingratiating Peter Van Vecten, with his reddish hair and his keen brown eyes, also his polished manners, left a very deep impression on them all. But not only is he a daredevil cutting-edge technologist because of the plane, he's also an old-fashioned guy, right? With polished manners, with a traditional classical beauty, right? So it's this combination of risk and normality or norming of, of the male character. The other suggested implied potential romance is between Billy and Daniel Moore. The same way that initially Billy runs to save, to rescue Peter from the wreckage of the plane, even when she encounters Daniel Moore, the horse is scared by the automobile and Daniel is first taken by the horse, then dropped, falls to the ground, and Billy runs to save him, to rescue him. Okay, of course, this is a reversal of the traditional trope whereby the man saves the woman. This is a more independent, more powerful woman and therefore she has to save the man, and, and then she finds Billy, Daniel, Billy finds Daniel attractive, right? And he's a cowboy, a pure, authentic cowboy, which makes him exotic, very wholesome American boy, a bachelor, of course, otherwise the dreams of romance would be, not be possible, wealthy, even though he's a farmer, he's wealthy, and he has servants, uh, Japanese servants. So, Rescuing and being rescued, getting the leadership in a relationship, relinquishing this leadership at other moments is part of the interaction between Billy, the other female characters, and the male characters. And this can be seen in the relationship between Billy and Peter. Later on, will be Peter saving, uh, at least once, saving um, Billy. Daniel, same thing. She uh, takes care of Daniel. Daniel helps Billy and the others when they're kidnapped by the train robbers. Daniel is there, of course. He just reappears, keeps reappearing in the novel. And most importantly, it's all about trouble. Getting into trouble intentionally, by choice, or encountering trouble on the road, such as finding train robbers. So, yes, there is subversion of some of the social norms in terms of where it is acceptable for a young woman uh, not accompanied by an adult man to be found. And there are always exceptional circumstances justifying this pushing of the norms. The norms are not 
subverted entirely. They're pushed towards the edge. That's why I use the word edging. And norming means reestablishing the boundaries, right? It's not like we're completely free. No, we're just moving the boundaries, establishing slightly different norms. And this is the example that I gave before when Billy goes up a tree and she removes the coat, the long coat she has to drive the automobile. And underneath, she has these uh, kinds of pants for uh, women and you can find an entire article on them because uh, there is an entire history of how society in Western Europe or the US reacted to women wearing these kinds of pants called bloomers which became symbolic of the feminist revolution and then a lot of societies during that time were not accepting this kind of clothings for, for women, which made them different from the role assigned to society. And, and as I said, the man who sees them, who's Barney McGee says, must be a suffragette, must have thought she was a suffragette of feminism. And later on, one of the robbers that escapes with them, the one who will become a regular citizen of society, is being dressed to escape control and captured by the sheriff being dressed as a female automobilist. So this is also a little bit edgy. 